Hello everybody, as promised, I am going back in time, going through all the old, old, old comments that I have just been ignoring for all these years. So I'm going to dig back as far as I can. This is one of the older ones from three years ago. Can you please explain the dying swan arms? Yes. Little side note, dying swan, the music is not dying swan. The music is just the swan. And it's part of like the Carnival of Animals by Camille Saint-Saëns. And you should check out the rest of that music. There's some like cool music in there that you might have heard. Like the aquarium music is like this like cool, like kind of like creepy music. And I'm, I almost, I can almost guarantee you heard it somewhere before. So the first thing to keep in mind about the dying swan, or the swan, um, is that it is a solo. It was originally choreographed for Anna Pavlova, who was, you know, like a prima ballerina of her time. And when you get something like choreographed just for you, or when you are a prima ballerina or a soloist, a lot of it is up to your interpretation as the artist. And if you go on YouTube and look up different dancers doing the swan or the dying swan arms, everybody does it a little bit different. If you go way back to OG dying swan with Anna Pavlova in what, like 1920 or something, she doesn't even do the, the typical swan arms. She starts, like, she does something like She's like fluffing up the the air in front of her. So keep that in mind. There's no real 100% right way to do it. It's going to change a little bit depending on the dancer, depending on the tempo in which the conductor is playing the music, how you're feeling that day. You know, if somebody is coaching you, they might give you like tips to make it look pretty, make it look smooth and fluid but there is no one single right way to do it. So for example, if you watch Maya Plisetskaya, who arguably has like some of the most beautiful port de of all of the Russian ballerinas, she kept her swan arms kind of low. She did not really let her hand go too far above her her shoulder. She was more of like a, a down swan arm. Her hands would go as low as, uh, you know, almost waist height, you know, almost, almost level with her tutu. So she, she kept it more here. And that might actually be easier because you don't have to fight with keeping your shoulders down, you know, if your arms are already low, it becomes challenging when you when you want to bring the arms higher because you still have to fight to keep your shoulders down. However, if you watch Natalia Makarova do it, her swan arms are higher. The, the lowest her hand will go is maybe like rib cage height and her hands go pretty high. And I would argue that this is harder. <laughs> she does let her shoulders go up and down a little bit. She does. She will use the whole back and she does allow the shoulders to go up, but she's Natalia Makarova. She can do whatever she wants. <laughs> Natalia Makarova would also play with different tempos. She got the most like, playful and whimsical. So she would start like like this, she'd do a big slow one, she'd do a couple like really fast little baby waves. She played around with the tempo a little bit more. When you watch Svetlana Zakharova do it, she takes a bigger range of motion, but also tends to keep it a little slower. So she'll kind of do She'll take all of this, and uh, it's pretty hard too. Bearing all of that in mind, 
that there are multiple levels that you can play with. The biggest tips that I have for you is to imagine that your arms have no bones, <laughs> um, which is very difficult. So we have our shoulder joint, our elbow joint, and our wrist joint. And we have to keep a little bit of resistance in the arms because we don't want any harsh angles. You know, we, we don't want anything to look too bent or broken. The, the magic of the swan arms is that it looks really fluid. It looks like, it looks like a wave. It looks like, um, like those, those ribbon dancer toys where, you know, it just kind of like keeps going. You have to like restrain and control and almost keep tension in your joints so they don't bend too much. But then you also have to like exaggerate these little in-between muscles that can't bend to make them appear like they are bending, like one continuous flowy movement. And this comes from a feeling of stretching out long, like, like somebody is pulling your arms in two different directions. You kind of want to be as wide as possible. Like you have all this energy that is just coming out of your back and the only place it can escape is like out there. Do you ever see those like wacky, flailing, inflatable tube people in front of car dealerships? It's that same like energy trying to escape out and then there's that battle that you have of trying to restrain it in your joints. There is tension. This looks like such a nice, like fluid, loose, free movement, but there is a lot of like tension. I, you can see like, my muscles are popping. <laughs> my muscles are, are straining to, um, support that, to contain it. So the way I think of swan arms is starting in the back and not necessarily the center of the back because when you start squeezing the center of the back, you start like kind of squeezing the shoulder blades together. And then that, that shortens you, you know, that kind of brings things in and you look like creepy, like the opposite of a swan. So instead of trying to get your power from the shoulder blades and instead of feeling like you're pushing down the top of your shoulder down. Imagine instead that it's coming from like right here, like the bottom of the scapula and like kind of under the armpit. Those are your lats. That's, that's really where a lot of ballet back muscle support comes from. It's more here and less here. So it starts from here and this energy has to go somewhere. So the first place it goes is to the elbow. Usually the elbow initiates a lot of these movements. So your elbow comes up to whatever level you decided your swan arms are at. If I'm Maya Plisetskaya, it doesn't go much higher above my shoulder. If I'm Natalia Makarova, I I bring it to about here. If I'm Svetlana Zakharova, she, I think she went even higher than that. Um, so it's your elbow. And then even after your elbow has reached its peak and it starts to go down, that energy keeps going into the forearm and the hand. It's like a, 
it's like a wave, you know, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a chain reaction. So a very exaggerated swan arm would look like that. But like I said, we have to kind of eliminate these breaks in the joints. We kind of have to smooth them out a little bit. So, you know, your elbow goes up and then as the elbow comes down, that motion continues through the hand. And then same thing going the other way. When your elbow reaches its lowest point down here at the bottom, maybe the elbow starts going back up but you gotta finish it out with the hand. You know, it's it's really like a, you know, this it's a wave, it's a wave. It's just a very um, stretched out wave with a lot of tension. So this does take a bit of practice. It is also gonna make you very sore. <laughs> Even even professionals, when they start rehearsing Dying Swan or they start rehearsing like anything in Swan Lake, the first thing they complain about is, oh, so sore, their upper bodies get so sore. So you, you are going to get sore. If you're sitting at home like practicing this, trying to practice, okay, do I like a low swan arm? Do I like a high swan arm? Do I like a big range of motion? It's, you're going to you're gonna be sore. <laughs> so be prepared for that. And just keep in mind that it is normal. You know, you're working muscles that you don't use every day. Like who the, who the hell does this? <laughs> and another thing that I notice just anatomically, um, there is slight rotation. It's not a lot of rotation, but there is slight rotation when you do this. When, when you lift the arm, there's a slight inwards rotation, and then when you come back down, there's like a slight outward rotation, and I think, I think this kind of helps disguise the elbow joint, you know, because if you kept your arm just flat and did not allow it to rotate, if you kept it flat like this and tried to do it, it's not gonna, you can't, you can't. You have to rotate the arm in and out a little bit to achieve that. There is also a little bit of an elbow bend and straighten. Again, I think this creates the illusion of a round, wavy arm, you know, the, the bend happens when it comes up and then the straighten happens when it comes down. Because if you were to keep it bent as it comes down, you'd have a dropping, droopy, like chicken wing elbow that all the teachers hate to see. So on the up, it's very like round and almost concave, like, like a, you're making like a concave shape under your armpit. And then on the way down, the elbow straightens a little bit because you never want to drop your elbow. Even when you're lowering your arms, the elbow should never be like bent all the way. So on the way down, it's even more of a stretch and a straighten so that you don't get this. You know, you can, you can bend it slightly more going up, but on the way down, you almost have to like stretch it out more. So elbow up and then stretch it out, stretch it out and like really, really like restrain and stretch the wrists and, and the, the fingertips have to follow, which is also really hard. Like how often do we do stuff like this in real life? When does that happen? Like why, why would anybody ever need to know how to do that? Oh, hurting. <sighs> On that note, I'm gonna go take a hot shower. <laughs> Thank you for watching and stay salty.